All this is Dr. Mubeen Sayyid from drbean.com. Welcome to one more show. This is a third talk for today. So uh, just a quick heads up. I have half an hour today. I have a call at 7. So uh, please give me uh, this permission to talk for half an hour. Uh, DDS, how are you? Rubies, how are you? So Ruby says, Denise TG, from what I figured from the original mRNA papers. OK, Denise is here. Hey, Denise, how are you? And all right, so let's start with the questions. Jenna, how are you? So what did you think about the talk this morning with Dr. Pierce? Scarlett says, I just sent a link on Twitter. OK, I'll check it out. Um, Jenna says, resting after a long infusion today and tomorrow. Is that the IVIG? Rubies and red. Uh, T helper one, two in healthy person is always in balance. Hence why people seem to catch infection fast. Cool. Very good. So let's start. So once again, as the cool beans uh, <laughs> come back live, uh, today I'm going to be here for half an hour. I have a call after 7 o'clock. So just a smaller time frame today. Uh, yesterday, I saw, um, I believe, Elk, uh, Cool Bean Elk. He was going over the talk yesterday and capturing the timestamps to kind of create that chapter-wise um, structure. And he commented that, hey, just doing this was a lot of work. So how would we do it if it is 10, 12, 24, 48 hours long discussion? I think that what should happen is that as we are talking, and there are some folks who are just keeping an eye on the um, on the screen, and if I show a question, so let's say here, Bar Barbie says, love this morning, thank you. So imagine if this was a question. So as a question is shown, they note down the time at that time. So then it doesn't have to be a looking on, and watching the whole thing again and then trying to work on it. So I still need <laughs> some volunteers who would, as we are doing the session, who can keep a tracking of the timestamps that we can then put in the description, and that would help. Cindy Glasgow says, hi, do does Dr. Jalali's platelet theory work into MCAS? Yes. Would ciproheptadine be useful? Yes. So I think that if that is happening, then there's going to be serotonin, there's going to be histamine as well, and then it would work, yes. Jody says, I miss this AM, we'll watch tomorrow. I think, Jody, today's discussion was really important. Um, Shayan says, can we get the link to the conference Dr. Tina Pierce was referring to, assuming it will be virtual or recorded? Thanks. So I actually saw her tweet. Let me see. I'm going to go and see if I can find it. Um, so this morning, she was tweeting. So give me one second. So I think, uh, Scarlett, this is the one you were saying, triple mutant COVID variant is probed by virologists. Awesome. <laughs> we have one more issue now. OK, I'll look into it. Um, so so I think this is the one. So here, Dr. Tina Pierce had tweeted, have just been interviewed by lovely Dr. Mubin Sayyid on his channel, talking about treatment for long COVID. He will be presenting our consent, uh, consensus protocol at the TLC conference. So here is the conference's um, link. So I'm going to put that link here in the chat. So Shayan, uh, it says treatlongcovid.com. So <clears throat> Colin Hamel says, Runner Bean loved the talk. Awesome. I saw that you uh, requested Dr. Pierce to move to a certain town or area. I did not know the geography there. OK, so let's see. Um, Mana Dr. Vanama says, sir, low histamine foods you asked to take and better is low citrus foods at the same time. 
you said vitamin C will be helpful. How can we explain this, sir, as vitamin C is more in citrus foods? So take vitamin C as a supplement, not as a citrus food. Eccentric says, eccentric says, are we collecting enough data about viruses to be able to determine right away once virus DNA sequence is mapped to accurately predict things like how it is transmitted, surface transmission, etc. No. So this is a very interesting question. We are only getting to a point with our artificial intelligent computers like Watson to be able to correctly predict how a protein will fold. What that means is when proteins are made, they are made like a long thread. And then they are folded just like you take a, a, a thread of yarn. And then with that yarn, you start uh, knitting a sheet like thing, which can then become a sweater or something or a cap. And it can first be a flat thing and then it can become three dimensional. It's just like that. In our cells, when the proteins are produced, they are just long threads. And as they're produced, they start folding because of the magnetic bonds in them and we have no idea how they will fold and we have no idea how they would then because of folding how they would function we can observe afterwards how do they function so for us to be able to predict just by the dna or the rna to say that this folding would look like this and that would give following properties to this pathogen or this protein we are very far from that So Colin says, can we get Dr. Tina Pierce on again as her work is very important? Absolutely, we can. So Scott says, I'm getting Johnson next week. <laughs> OK. Um, So Scarlett says, what is the difference between black fungus and white fungus? Black funguses are usually the fungi that cause blackness or necros necrosis or the tissue damage. There are black molds as well, which are going to look black. But in case of this black fungus that we're talking about, mucormycosis, this is called black fungus because it causes necrotic tissue, which looks black. And of course, the white fungus are the ones that do not do that. Denise says, Ro rosips are awesome for vitamin C and low histamine. Awesome. Thank you, Denise. Uh, <laughs> so Ruby says, first to hit the like on this video. Thank you very much, Rubies. Uh, Puru says, which will be the best vaccine for children? So at this time, the vaccine that has been approved is Pfizer. <laughs> so France says lazy beans, LNZ, Verly button. Oh, is that French or something, France? So hit the like button. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, so um, Tika says, question, Dr. Bean, do you have a video on Novavax, please? Yes. Uh, if you just look at my uh, channel, I think I've done more than one videos on Novavax. There is a video that I've said you would love this vaccine, Novavax. That is the title. Margaret says, hello, Dr. Bean, trying another channel. Hello, Margaret, how are you? So you are trying from Facebook right now. Very good. Welcome. Moorhouse Joplin says, my Moderna shots were fine, and now I feel great. Awesome. Melissa says, I took Moderna vaccine, both doses, and my severe rhinitis has dramatically improved. Is that possible and what mechanism? So I have actually heard this from many folks that after taking the vaccine, their allergic states or inflammatory states have become improved. I have to do some research to see what could happen. It is possible that the uh, vaccine triggers the immune system, including 
the T regulatory cells, which are supposed to calm down the immune system. And maybe that triggering of the T regulatory cells is so, so large or so intense that then when the T regulatory cells calm down the immune system, they calm it down everywhere. That may be the possibility. I have to do some more research, but I've heard this a lot. Alfred Chow says, South Africa appears to be beating COVID with ivermectin. India as well, my patients as well. So uh, ivermectin is a good thing. Jody says, I noticed last year around spring, the kids who ended up in hospital were thought to have been long over COVID. Is it possible allergy season kicked already annoyed immature system into overdrive? It is possible. So not only just the allergies, any inflammations that are present and then in presence of COVID or even the vaccines, you saw that I had some inflammation here and then the Moderna vaccine just made it go on for two, three weeks in high intensity. So yes, you're correct. If the system is already in a high, high drive and you, you uh, poke it further, it can go even further. There is one possibility and that is that if system, if immune system is in high drive and has become exhausted, for example, somebody fighting COVID for two, three weeks, and now you add something like mucormycosis and you have been giving, let's say steroids, you've been giving, the, the diabetes is not controlled, immune system is exhausted, they may not be able to respond well. But in the beginning, it is possible that immune system responds overwhelmingly because it is already in overdrive. Raiji says, MCAS, MCS, POTS, ITP, intracranial hypertension, my 16-year-old daughter, chromalin, nasal oral, live immune hyperdrive 24-7. She's survived through what people are now living from adverse reactions. You're correct. And, and Dr. Uh, Pierce talked about her daughter as well. So it might actually be very useful to connect with Dr. Pierce. I would actually request her to either join our Discord for the long haulers, or maybe she can create a Facebook group where folks can join her. Arubaga says, I got a yellow bruise from the second Moderna jab. Uh, Arubaga, how long? So it is seen that uh, the jab causes some rashes, but normally they go away as well. Uh, Arun says, maybe the rhinitis is due to different coronaviruses. Rhinitis has many reasons. It can be because of coronaviruses, but usually coronaviruses cause less rhinitis, more throat irritation. It can be because of rhin rhinovirus. It can be because of other common colds. It can be because of allergies. It can even be triggered by uh, drugs. <laughs> Margaret says, hi, back on YouTube. So welcome back, Margaret. Okay, so Joanne Epson says, can the lipid nanoparticle in the vaccine fuse with brain cells resulting in delayed neurodegenerative disease? No, short answer. I'll give you a little longer answer as well. So imagine this is the deltoid muscle. In this deltoid muscle, we have injected lipid nanoparticles, which are really, really tiny lipid particles. These kind of lipid particles are present in our blood as well, uh, called chylomicrons. Chylomicrons are the lipid particles that are brought in from the GIT, gastrointestinal tract, as we absorb our food. Then chylomicrons continue to circulate in our body, in our blood as well, and they are taking care of the, they're participants in cholesterol uh, homeostasis. It is a very similar structure here as well. For a lipid nanoparticle to be able to reach the brain cells, it would have to, first of all, escape this deltoid area where it, it is um, injected. And it's going to be very difficult for it to do that. The reason for that is that, first of all, when it is injected in the middle of a jungle of cells, so there are cells everywhere around this. It's not a free space 
So there are cells, there are muscle cells, there are immune system cells, there are fibroblasts and so on. So the lipid nanoparticle is injected here and there are blood vessels here as well, which are really tiny microscopic blood vessels. Now this particle here cannot just decide that, you know what, I'm gonna just take a tour or detour and get out. It is a lipid nanoparticle. It is going to become fused or absorbed into the neighboring cells very fast. That is one. Secondly, there are immune system cells that are going to pick it up as well. Number two. So what we have to now figure out is that this little particle, which is a very tiny amount, this particle has to first escape all of this. Then it has to enter the blood. Now to enter blood, what it has to do is this. The capillaries that are here, capillaries have bigger vessels than capillaries. It cannot enter them at all because the bigger vessels have lots of uh, coverings around them. And these things like chylomicrons or lipid particles can neither get in or if they are in, they cannot be out. So it is not going to be easy for the bigger vessels. But let's say there is a capillary here. Now, capillaries have these cells in them, which are here, which have junctions between the cells. So there are spaces between the cells. But these spaces are so narrow that fluids or some ions can come out and go back in, but not everything. Even the proteins that are present inside the blood, like albumin, which is a very tiny protein, cannot come out. It stays in. Now, a junction which is so tiny that a tiny, tiny protein like albumin cannot cross it. How can a big, chunky lipid nanoparticle with messenger RNA in it, that big, you know, <laughs> thing can just enter the blood? It cannot. So you would then say, okay, it cannot, but we have cells here. And the function of this lipid nanoparticle is to fuse with the cells. Cool. So let's do that. Let's say if there is, this is a blood vessel cell and the nanoparticle comes and attaches to it. You know what's going to happen is the particle is going to be picked up by the cell and it would be disseminated. It would be destroyed inside the cell. So there is no concept for this particle to actually cross through the cells. Although there are components that can cross through the cells, but they're not this big. This is like you're trying to uh, move an aeroplane, a plane through a car wash. So cars can pass through the car wash, but a plane cannot go through there. So this lipid nanoparticle in terms of scale is so big compared to the cell's function uh, structures that it is like a plane for those tiny holes. So it cannot just get in and go into the blood. So what it, if it gets fused, its components would be destroyed and the RNA would come out. The cell, the blood vessel cell in the deltoid region, that cell would now produce the spike proteins. Those would be destroyed inside the cell. Then the pieces of that will be shown up on the cell surfaces with MHC1. Now, you say, you know what? I want this particle to go in the blood because I want to see if it goes in the blood, what would it do in, in the brain area? So let's do that. Let's say we artificially damage this blood vessel. We create damage here. And because of that damage, we are going to create a hole in the blood vessel. Although this hole um, traditionally or from a mechanism point of view, very quickly will be patched up by platelets and they would cover it and close it. But let's say that the platelet said, you know what, we'll come back tomorrow. We're not going to do it today. And somehow we allowed the nanoparticle to enter that hole and get into the blood. So fine, now the nanoparticle is inside the blood vessel and it is now traveling throughout the body. It is going to be inside the blood vessel. From there, it is going to go back to the heart. From the heart, it will be then pumped out. And now there are, let's say, 1,000 nanoparticles, and they are in the, in the body, and some of them are going to go towards the brain. So let's say they have come into the brain. They have the same problem again. 
The problem is that the blood vessels, the arteries in which it is sitting now, these have huge layers around them, thick layers around them of muscle and connective tissue. So these arteries are not going to allow anything to come. I mean, lipid nanoparticle is a bigger thing. They don't even allow those tiny albumins and globulins to come out. So inside here, whatever is, that whatever cannot just come out. So now the particle is trapped in the blood vessel. Let's bring it to the brain. So here we have brain. And brain is now covered with barriers which are sitting between this blood vessel and the brain tissue. Now, this poor lipid nanoparticle has so many things to do now. Number one, it has to get out of this blood vessel. So a medicos would say to me, they'll say, you know what? No worries. I don't need to get it out of the big vessel. I will wait for this big vessel to become an, a capillary. And then I'll get it out because capillary doesn't have the walls that have muscles and those things. But the problem again for this little nanoparticle is that it has to get out of these gaps between the capillaries and in the blood brain barrier or testicular barrier or other barriers, these are shut down. That is why they're called barriers. Number one. Number two, around the capillaries are sophisticated walls that have cells with channels in them that would selectively pick things that they want to pick to bring into the brain tissue. So now we have a problem. It's not just a simple capillary that we have to struggle to get this particle in the capillary. Now we have to struggle to get it out of it as well. And not only that, but now the capillary has a barrier function around it. So capillary doesn't have these junctions, number one. Number two, it has this, this covering around this, which is the barrier. Number three, in the barrier, there are cells that would select what can cross them. And then number four, around the barrier are the brain's own immune system cells sitting and watching what is happening. Now we want this little culprit to escape them all and enter the brain. So let's say, let's give it. Let's say, you know what? It's going to just escape them all. Somehow it, it would be a stealthy ninja lipid nanoparticle and it's going to just get out. Fine. It got out and now it is in the brain tissue. Right? So when it is in the brain tissue, brain is very much used to working with the particles, just like other parts of our system as well. So what would happen? Let's say here is a neuron. Brain has a lots of uh, neurons, lot of immune system cells, stellate cells, and so on that would act like immune system. Ideally, this little particle, which is now lost in the jungle of the brain, is going to be picked up by some uh, immune system particle or, or stellate cells or astrocytes. And they're just going to eat it up and destroy it and create the spike proteins in them and create the pieces of them, present them on their surface, and the local immune reaction would occur. If the neuron picks it up, neuron do the MIC1 presentation as well. So there will be no issue if if this particle has somehow magically reached the brain. But now if we go back, number one, if it has reached the brain, no issues. Can it break the blood brain barrier and go there? That means somebody has meningitis or those things that the, or the blood brain barrier is broken. Now, many people ask me this, that, hey, I had a stroke 10 years ago. Look, if you had a stroke and you have recovered and you're not on a hospital bed because of um, uh, neurological issues or brain tissue problems, that means your layers have healed. That is why you're acting normal now. In that case, these things cannot cross blood-brain barriers. So if we now say that, hey, I still wanted to cross it, then that means we have to damage the blood-brain barrier first. Now, some folks can say, you know what? We can have RNA, messenger RNA, making spike proteins in the blood that then makes the, the spike protein then acts with the cell to cause endothelial damage. We know it does that. But the problem is, the messenger RNA needs a cell's machinery to make a spike protein. And so that means the lipid nanoparticle has to stop 
and enter the endothelial cell. Now we have so many chylomicrons that are formed after we eat food. They do not stop and, and work with the endothelial cells. Why? Because blood is flowing so fast and the endothelial cell surfaces are so slippery that we want nothing to attach to them. As soon as a tiny particle attaches there, local inflammation would occur. So can a lipid nanoparticle attach to an endothelial cell? Not at all. Until you stop the blood flow over there and let it settle on the cell, which would not happen. If we are going to stop the blood flow for some reason, there must be a pathology and that would be an other issue altogether. So now this little particle is praying that he somehow I want to enter a cell near the blood brain barrier. And even if it enters an endothelial cell, blood vessel cell, now the particle is praying. I want to make a spike protein that appears on the surface of the cell and then go and bind with some ACE2. And that's not going to happen. We're going to break down that spike protein and show the pieces of that on MIC1. So it is such an impossibility for a particle to go all the way from here and traverse to the brain and escape deltoid muscle structures, enter the blood, breaking all the, uh, all the uh, physiological mechanisms, then enter the brain and then do all the defeat all the mechanisms there and then in the brain. If that is the case, then the particle itself is not a problem. Then the person has bigger issues. So I hope that answers that question. Shayan says, uh, do you think in future pandemics, big data along with AI could help find best anecdotal results quickly and recommend randomized double blind trials to help establish? Yes, so I think it could be. Even now, I think computers are helping a lot and advanced technologies are helping a lot. Raiji says, please, if already in her state of immune hyperdrive, never having COVID, this shot, I fear, will cause further damage to her already taxed system. Her MCDR retire, retired one year early. We have no advocate. Um, MC doctor. So this is the uh, people who have allergies are supposed to not take medicine, uh, vaccine, or people who have severe allergies. So really, this is a discussion between the doctor and the, and the patient to decide what is best. I do not think that there is someone who can force people to take medicine. At the same time, somebody commented this morning, I think in the Discord server, that my daughter is compelled to take vaccine because she cannot return to college without it. So I think these are the kind of things that I have less control over. Uh, but people who have allergies, they have to be careful from the vaccines. They have to be careful. They have to talk with the doctors and understand it. James Nguyen says, COVID is killing high numbers of children in Brazil, and experts aren't sure why. So I had done a discussion about the COVID and the Brazil. One of the reasons was that just it is spread so much that after the elderly, it is now spreading to the adults and children as well. So I have done a discussion of what are the possible reasons. Colin Hamill says, our bodies are great. V factories, which you explained so well. Thank you very much. Our, our bodies are very sophisticated. They're not some dumb cells sitting around. They are very intelligent uh, systems. Denise says, we should all be on mass cell protocol. As far as I'm concerned, lol effect so much. Absolutely. I think we all should have some level of. Um... James Newton says, what will be his, her bigger issue? Uh, James, uh, in terms of what? So Serenity says, my incel DXA is high GM CSF. What is that? 
uh, granulocyte monocyte colony stimulating factor. So what that is is the following. Um, so when the immune system cells are active, for example, macrophages especially, dendritic cells especially, and neutrophils as well, when they are active, so they are part of innate immune cell, they release granulocyte monocyte colony stimulating factor. This cytokine will go to bone marrow. And in the bone marrow, the stem cells that are making more cells, it would tell them to make more granulocyte and monocyte. So that means make more immune system cells, including more macrophages and more monocytes, which can give rise to macrophages and just make more immune system cells, which can then cause a recursive issue that now we have more immune system cells, more macrophages, they would continue to be more mad and the cycle continues. And that is a macrophage activation system more than a mast cell activation syndrome. If it is a mast cell activation issue, then you would see more histamine producing cells or more antibodies that are priming the mast cells. This simply means that the immune system is producing too much of the cytokines to say, I need more immune system cells. So immune system is stuck in a cycle. Now, how to manage this? Very simple. Steroids. Steroids would calm down the immune system, stop all of these things production and balance it out. If not that, then the second part is going to be ivermectin, antihistamines. But the first, if this is something that is with a person, my first uh, go-to will be steroids. Haberdel says, what is the need for renal embryonic tissue in the vaccine? What functions would this tissue have? So number one, there is no need. Number two, this tissue is not there. We have had these discussions in the past as well. Vaccines, some vaccines, especially the adenovirus-based vaccines, are built inside the fetal renal tissues clones or copies of those cells. So we need cells to build viruses because viruses do not have their own machinery to do their own metabolism. So we need to put viruses in cells and cells offer the viruses the machinery to replicate. So when we are making adenoviruses, for example, for Johnson & Johnson or for AstraZeneca or for Sputnik or for other such vector-based vaccines, many companies use fetal cell copies. Other companies use copies of the cells from monkeys. So these fetal cells are human fetal cells. Then there are companies that use monkey cells. Then there are companies that use butterfly cells. So there are all kinds of cell lines that are used to build the vaccine. Once a cell has built the vaccine, imagine just like honeybees make, make uh, honey. Imagine the cell in which you put the, uh, the adenovirus it would replicate those adenoviruses and make a lots of them. Those adenoviruses are the vaccine. So then we break those cells, like you break an egg and you remove the shell, that is a cell. And then from inside the cell, you don't take everything, but you remove the adenoviruses. So there are sophisticated filtering mechanisms that take the adenoviruses out, clean them, shower them, and then put them in a vaccine. So Arun Mehta says, it is, is it not worth asking the relation between serotonin and histamine? Dr. Tina is in her one slide wrote SSRI. So yes, so uh, serotonin and histamine are released by similar immune dysfunctions. So, so Samina has a question. Some foods like shrimp, beef, brinjal, etc., produce allergic reactions. Any comments with histamine? So let's separate this with the other foods we talked about. There are some foods, for example, eggplant, that just has more histamine in it. So whoever eats it will get more histamine or avocado or other such foods that we talked about. So these foods have histamine in them or aged cheese. 
then there are foods that can trigger the release of histamine. Now, not all foods can do that, number one. Number two, not all foods do that to everyone. For example, shellfish or shrimp or some or peanuts, they don't cause allergies in everyone. They cause it in some people. 20% of the society can respond to certain things to which the remaining 80% do not respond with allergies. And they would then cause mass cell activation and they would then cause release of histamine. So if I go back to your question here, food like shrimp, beef, brinjal, etc., produce allergic reactions. Yes, it can happen in some people. That doesn't mean these foods have histamine. That simply means these foods have something that caused in some people the triggering of the mast cell and re result is the, um, the allergies. So rubies and red says, but I love avocado and aged cheese. Question is, do you have mast cell activation syndrome? If you don't have it, then yeah, please eat them. <laughs> Sky Frog says, good, I hate eggplant. So between you and me, don't tell my wife, I hate eggplant as well. <laughs> Roman says, rubies are right. I'm afraid of these new vaccines. I'm not anti-vax. Have always been glad to be up to date on my shots. Perhaps Dr. Bean's dream Novavax might change my mind if it can. So I really am looking forward for the Novavax. And I hope, I pray in my heart's heart that when it comes out, it has good efficacy. It would be a dud if it comes out and the efficacy is not great. That would be a shame. <laughs> Christine says, Sky Frog, I don't touch eggplant, weird texture. Tanya Clark says, will taking a low dose of Motrin and, a, and Benadryl shortly after second jab of Pfizer lower the effectiveness of Vax? No. Vaccine second jab would wake up the sleeping cells which will proliferate and increase. So these over-the-counter type things are not strong enough to just cause. So what will cause it? Let's compare it to that. Steroids. Strong steroids given after the second jab or first jab can suppress the immune system, even then not enough to have no effect of the vaccine. So these are like tiny things. Carlos says, Dr. Bean, if SARS-CoV-2 is ingested rather than breathed in, would one expect a more or less severe disease if viral load is the same? So the SARS-CoV-2 in 4% of the people can actually go through the gastrointestinal route, causes gastroenteritis, then gets absorbed, and then gets to the rest of the systemic issues as well. Now, there is a study that said that those folks who have a higher presence of the viral load in the GIT um, cells or who have more of the nasal, uh, you know, anosmia occurs or more of the GIT symptoms, they have severer disease. Although in my experience so far, every patient who had COVID and had GIT issues, I have not seen more severe disease in them than others. Now, at the same time, none of my patients have ever become severe. And that may be just because I attack their immune, uh, I attack their virus so fast and so aggressively that maybe it doesn't get a chance to become severe. So touch wood, I already have one person who passed away even after ivermectin. I don't want anyone else to be hurt. But I think it is um, It is said in, in research papers that that is the case, but I've not seen it. Um, John H says, are spike proteins antibodies, are spike protein antibodies a reliable indicator of immunity? Not that the lab's positive result is greater than 0 0.8, note, and results are coming back at 500 plus or even greater than 2,500. That what is That is what is truly happening. So um, if the question just this much, are they reliable indicator when present, then 
and present in the right quantity greater than the cutoff threshold, then yes. But the thing is this, that there are some people, and I have done this uh, little graph uh, sometimes before as well, and that is there are some people which respond to vaccines with the innate arm much strongly. For example, children do that, or some adults do it. And in them, there is not a lot of antibody. And if the, now they are waiting for antibody levels to go up, they're not going to go up because their innate arm was just good enough. Then there are some folks whose T helper one or the cytotoxic arm takes a dominant role in controlling the infection. In them also, the, the T helper two pathway or the vaccine, uh, sorry, the antibody pathway is not going to be dominant. So it really depends. You, We are looking for those people whose antibody pathway would be dominant, apparently majority. And we are saying, well, fine. If this is dominant, then we are good. But in other people who may be vaccinated or have infection, this could be dominant. This could be dominant. There could be co-domination as well. And in such people, if you do the, the um, antibody titers, you might not see any significant antibodies. Then the antibodies can actually start declining after three months. So if you do the titer after three months, you may, may not see sufficiently pleasing titers of the antibodies, but that doesn't mean immune, uh, your body cannot handle it. So there's a question Bilal says, how do you diagnose MCAS? That is a problem. You There is no diagnosis lab structure. I mean, you can measure histamines, you can measure serotonin, you can measure other inflammatory markers, but what does that mean? It doesn't say this is MCAS, it just says there is an inflammatory system going on, inflammatory problems occurring. That is what Dr. Pierce was saying in the morning as well, that this has always been difficult to prove MCAS. And so now with Dr. Bruce Patterson's in-cell diagnosis company's work, and I have no relationship to them or interest with them of any sort. They are now producing a set of labs because of the COVID that may actually start helping identify MCAS. So it is more of a clinical um, assessment than labs. And the problem is you can only do clinical assessment if you know to suspect MCAS and if you understand what MCAS is. Many doctors actually don't believe in it. They simply call the person psychologically upset or this is in their head or they would. So the thing that really, really bothers me is when cool beans reach out to me and say, I have long haul syndrome and my workplace doesn't agree with this and I have to work while I am going through the confusion and disorientation and dizziness and fatigue and myalgias and I still have to work because they don't understand what this is. That is a tragedy. Nina Lord says, Dr. Bean, have you heard anything about in Inovio's vaccine? No, I have not. Let's see what it is. Inovio vaccine. Inovia's COVID vaccine funding acts as U.S. says, as U.S. says, thanks, but no thanks. Interesting. Uh, U.S. officials have pulled the plug on a funding a phase three trial for Inovia's COVID-19 vaccine, telling the biotech that another vaccine is no, no longer needed as inoculations pick up around the country. The Plymouth meeting Pennsylvania-based biotech's shared tumbled around 28%. Inovia, so what is this... Uh, So look into that. Inovia says that technology delivers plasmids to cells via injections into the muscle or the skin's dermis layer using a handheld device that opens small pores in the cell with an electrical pulse. I think I talked about this very early on, that there is this technology. And the technology has been questioned and it does not have any single approved product. Well, that was the case with Moderna as well. The company provided links to other contacts with the US. Interesting. So I'll, I'll do some more discussion, but I remember I became very excited when I saw their delivery, how, how they were delivering it. 
So Denise says, true need and MK specialist. However, many psychiatrists do now realize much supposed psych symptoms are indeed MCAS and central immunologists. Very, very good. And that is a problem that people are really getting in. So Ali Abedin says, so thank you very much for the super chat. My IgG is 80 AU per milliliter six months after COVID. Should I take six months after COVID? Should I take Pfizer now? How do I know if any of the Pfizer ingredients is bad for me or can cause reaction? Is there any test I can do? So the the only indicator, possible indicator, is if you had had severe allergies in the past, then maybe Moderna can cause polyethylene glycol issues. One. Second, if you are very concerned, then you are you go to an immunologist and, or an allergist. For example, I, I discussed a case of two healthcare workers who had allergic reaction to the first dose. Then they went to the immunologist who tried to find out what components of Moderna could cause allergies. And then they gave them a graded dose. So if really there is a issue, then you can go to immunologist who will have to acquire Moderna vaccine and then use that as a test to figure out if you have allergies to, to that. Otherwise, there is nothing known that who would react to it other than saying anybody who is severely allergic in the past should not take this. So that is one part of the answer. And then 80 AU per milliliter, six months after. So number one, six months after is a good number. And number two, your test kit should tell what is the AU that should have been the cutoff. I think normally it is 1 or 1.5. If that is the case, it is good enough. Now, do you want to have the vaccine? That is your decision. I have seen some folks benefiting from the vaccine. Others, we, we discussed a study a few days ago not a few days, a few weeks ago, where we saw that they administered the vaccine after the infection. And they saw that after the first dose, it kind of kicked off the antibodies. After second dose, it didn't do anything, which I understand. So can it be useful? Sure, one more, one more electrical shock to the body to say COVID can come and be more ready. But you, if your body has already taken care of COVID itself, the big deal itself, then ideally you should be fine. Leah Johnson says, if I have a paradoxical reaction to Benadryl, would adrenaline be a problem? No, that should. So adrenaline should not be a problem. That They both are separate and you'll have to kind of test them out separately. Yes, so it's already 7.14. So Melissa says, don't forget your call. So it's already 7.14. So how about we do this? A couple of more questions, and then we stop. Melissa, thank you very much. Um, Luis Grande says, is there a copy of that, of the MCAS protocol from earlier today? Got on here late. So one, the... The video itself has the um, protocol in it. Secondly, I'm going to show it. And I think <laughs> Dr. Corey and folks may not be very happy with me doing it. But let me show you. Give me one second. Let me open my protocol. So <clears throat> I am writing. Let me show you this protocol here. So my request to you that if you're looking at it, please don't take copy or don't uh, present it. But here is the protocol that I have uh, written up. This protocol has an algorithm to figure out what kind of an issue is present and then what kind of medication to use. My uh, next part of this before it appears on various sites, including mine, and I think on FLCCC, is to create a uh, flowchart to say, if this, then do this, and if this, then do this. So I have just not found enough time. Maybe this weekend, I'll sit down and create that flowchart, finalize it. This morning, Dr. Pierce was also saying that, hey, can you send me that? I want to put that on my site, too. So uh, doing it, hopefully, this weekend, I'll finish it, and then it can appear on FLCC and Dr. Pierce's site. I would put that on Dr. Bean as well. So 7.14, 7.16. So one more question, and then we stop, as I promised, two questions. 
uh, Scarlett Monahan says, where is ivermectin stored in the body? Is it in the muscles? Is it stored in the plasma blood? How long can it stay in the body and be effective? Scarlett, beautiful questions. This is one area. For one year, I've been talking about ivermectin. And I've been thinking, I need to look at the pharmacokinetics and dynamics of this drug to understand where does it get stored. Because that is the only one part. I know it is stored, and it is released, and it can be effective for days. But where exactly it is stored? How is it released? What triggers the release? What triggers the storage? What is the, um, <laughs> what is the concentration uh, that we need to work? We know half-life that it becomes plasma peak is in six to eight hours, and then the half-life is 18 hours. I know those, but I do not know the answers to these, and I have been thinking about it for so long. Maybe that would be my additional homework for this weekend to finalize the uh, protocol for long haulers, plus look at this one. So apologies, I can't, I don't want to make up an answer. I actually, myself, I'm curious about it. Arun Changani says, you're world's guru. Thank you. You're very welcome. We are doing it together. DDS, we love you, but go make that call. Yes, thank you very much. So guys, do me a favor. Please like, subscribe, and share. And then there are some links in the description. I do not know if this one has GoFundMe or not, but it has the other links. There's a PayPal link. There's a link to buy me a coffee. There's a link to be a patron, whichever one you like. And if you didn't want to support as well, that is totally fine too. I never did this to, to have the support. Thank you very much. And I would see you Monday morning. Bye-bye for now.